Let's uh, welcome Dimis Mihailidis. Dimis is a leading, internationally recognized leading authority on leadership and innovation, and a magician. Thank you, Marios. Good morning, everybody. Um, when I first uh, read the five v brand new values of PWC, um, I read them with care, integrity. That's great, it's crucial. We make a difference. We're adding value. That is also absolutely necessary to stay in business. We work together, collaboration. It's necessary to create that value. Am I really surprised? Really surprised? Well, not yet. But when I come to caring and imagination, I am surprised. And I'm very positively surprised because the words caring and imagination, they're not really a big part of our business vocabulary. And Philippos showed us some interesting numbers on, uh, on these two values. So what I propose to do now is interpret, reimagine the possible. What can it mean? And I'd like to begin by introducing you to a British scientist, Arthur C. Clarke, Perhaps some of you know him already. Arthur C. Clarke was a scientist. He's a science writer and a science fiction writer. He passed away in the year 2008. He was also an inventor and an undersea explorer. Um, Arthur C. Clarke, or Sir Arthur C. Clarke, because he was knighted um, uh, later on in his life, uh, he is credited with first imagining a geostationary communication satellite. And he published that in 1945 in Wireless World. And 20 years later, this, this creation of his own imagination became a reality when Intelsat launched the first commercial geostationary communication satellite, the first ever. Lots of polysyllabic words in that, is, in that sentence. Um, Arthur C. Clarke also discovered the underwater ruins of a temple from the 6th century AD in 1956. He did that when he was scuba diving off the coast of Sri Lanka, I believe. And most of all, um, Arthur C. Clarke is known for his writing. He wrote nearly 100 books on science and science fiction as well. And perhaps the most prominent is the one that became a great film as well. It's 2001, A Space Odyssey. It was made into a film by um, Stanley Kubrick, and it remains a classic of the science fiction genre. Why did I pick Arthur C. Clarke? I think I picked him because he also proposed three laws, and they're known as the three laws of Arthur C. Clarke, and here they are. The first one says, when a distinguished elderly scientist states that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he is very probably wrong. The second law is a little shorter. It's a lovely one, too. The only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. And the third one, I love the third one. It's the shortest one. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Let's have a closer look at them. Let's begin with the first one, and I'll read it again. When a distinguished and elderly scientist states that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he is very probably wrong. Instead of giving you examples, I prefer 
that we watch a video. you see distinguished elderly scientists will say lots of things um, how does this relate to us I don't know I'm speculating here but I guess that at the beginning of the financial crisis in 2013 in Cyprus I am sure that a distinguished elderly partner said we're going to get out of this fast, and PwC will grow in the process. And I'm pretty sure that there was another distinguished elderly partner who said, no, that's not possible. It's going to be a prolonged crisis. PwC will not emerge intact. I believe this must have happened somewhere, and in a way that validates the truth of Arthur Clarke's first law. Now, let's move on to the second law. I'll spend a little bit more time on this one. The only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. Now, what could that mean? It brings to my mind the fact, the fact, that most great ideas do not have their origins in rational thought. I know it's disconcerting, but it's true. Let's go back a few thousand years. Think of Archimedes. Archimedes was charged with finding out if the new golden crown of the king was made out of real gold. And he took a bath, and he discovered the principle of displacement of water when he connected two things that were not connected, the metal of the crown and the level of the bath water. And the story says that he jumped out of the bathtub and started running stark naked around uh, the city of Syracuse shouting, Evrika, Evrika, Eureka, I have found the solution. So, it's not rational thinking that sparked that idea. Say hello to Einstein. 
who discovered the theory of relativity when he imagined he was traveling on a beam of light. He was not reading books, physics books. He was not doing equations. He did that later. He had to do it to prove the theory. The idea came from a strange picture in his mind, from an impossible picture. Here's another physicist, another Nobel Prize winner, meet Richard Feynman. And his breakthrough ideas, he said many times, they came when work and play became the same thing. He said, I'm playing, I'm working, I'm playing, I'm working. And when the two blurred, that's when he came upon his key idea, if you like. And if we just move out of the world of physics for a moment, Here's another nice face. This is Salvador Dali. Salvador Dali would sit on an armchair, and he would hold a silver spoon, and he would place a silver tray on the floor. And when he dozed off, he would drop the spoon, which would hit the tray and make a noise and wake him up. And during that split second, that's when he visualized the, his best pictures. He got up and he started painting. And um, if we look at research, you know, after these, these are colorful examples, and we also all know about Newton's apple as well, um, as being the spark for his um, theory of gravity. Uh, but he's not a researcher, he's a great um, writer on creativity, Edward de Bono. He interviewed 13 Nobel Prize winners and he noted that only one had reached his breakthrough discovery through rational, analytical thinking. And I would really like to believe that there's a little bit of that in Reimagine the Possible. And our friend Einstein concluded by saying, if at first an idea is not absurd, then there is no hope for it. Now, how easy is it to imagine impossible things? For some people, it's easy. For other people, it's difficult. Or for all of us, it might be easy at some moments and very difficult at other moments. Um, I think Lewis Carroll said it very nicely. There's no use trying, Alice said. One can't believe impossible things. I dare say you haven't had much practice, said the queen. Why, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. So what is stopping Alice from imagining the impossible? Let me rephrase the question. What's stopping you from imagining the impossible. And I will ask you to enter your app, please. And you will find a little poll. And please do not answer the poll uh, before I read out the options. And here are the options, because you'll have 30 seconds to think about them after I read them out. First one is, my imagination was deactivated after adolescence. Some of you might blame it on puberty. The second one, maybe it's a stereotype. Accountants are not paid to imagine things at work. I can't share my dreams with my colleagues. They'll laugh at me. So blame it on the others. Or blame it on the partners. Our partners and directors don't want to hear my new ideas. I have too much work to do. That's number five. So enter one, two, three, four, or five. And how about thinking about it for 30 seconds? I will call out when the time is up, and Theo will close the poll in 30 seconds from now. Aha. Who? We have a clear winner now. OK. 
okay, 10 more seconds. I believe, is anybody, does anybody need one more moment or two? 75 responses, that's good. Let's close the poll. Now there is a clear winner too. I have too much work to do. And have they really told you that imagination is not part of your work? There were five people talking about a huge account and how you got this huge account. Was it really done without any imagination? Sure, there was rigor, there was logic, there was focus. Was the imagination part zero? I don't think so. And I believe that in part, the reimagine the possible is an invitation to everybody to begin using the imagination at work. Um, now, whew, um, it's by far the biggest. The other ones are probably equal, so we're not blaming anybody else. Uh, but just think about how you can integrate this imagination into your work. Let's move on. Please. How can we learn to imagine the impossible? And my suggestion is that we change the way we look at things. Because when we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. It's a little quote and I'll prove it to you. Can I please ask you to raise your arm like this and point to the ceiling and look up at the ceiling and imagine there's a clock that's stuck on the ceiling and you are pointing to 12 o'clock. And do as I do now, move your finger to three o'clock and now to six o'clock and nine o'clock and again back to 12 o'clock. And keep moving your finger round and round clockwise. That imaginary clock. Move clockwise and gently begin to lower your arm. Keep going round clockwise, but lower your arm, bend your elbow. You should be near eye level now. Keep going down, down, you should be at shoulder level, go a little bit lower, keep going around and look at your finger. Is it going around clockwise or anti-clockwise? <laughs> clockwise or anti-clockwise? Anti-clockwise. And that proves that when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. <laughs> now, I want to make something clear. Creativity is not about being silly. It's about making our imagination work for us. And an occasional trip to childhood and back is good for all of us. That's what we're saying. That's why I keep reading Alice in Wonderland. It's a wonderful book. Read it from beginning to, the end, to end if you haven't done so. Um, so reimagine the possible. If I were to interpret it, I would say we need to make the magic real. And imagination is necessary. It's very necessary, but it's not sufficient. Because our trip to fantasy land has a return ticket. And if I were to present it schematically, it would look like that. Um, if we have one axis, a ver the vertical one, which is a fantasy axis, and a horizontal one, which is the feasibility axis, um, think of these ideas down here as being ordinary, and the ideas up there as being fantastic. The think of them as being really value-adding. We're talking about our challenges now. Um, and the feasibility axis, it's not possible or impossible, but think about it as easy, easy to implement, or impossible. And somewhere in the middle, you have, uh, it's getting hard, then harder, and then it's impossible. Now, we are probably 
you are probably at A. We're doing things we know, we're doing them well. Um, it's not necessarily easy, but it's um, not new either. Where we want to go is we want to go to B. We can't go right out there where, it's, where things are impossible, but we want to go to a level that is value-adding for somebody, for our clients, or for ourselves. And here's what this reimagining the possible says. You don't do this in a straight line. You do it in a journey that looks like this. The first part of the journey is imagination. And it really is going out into the impossible, like Archimedes, like Einstein, and so many others. And part two is reason. Yes, we need reason. We need to bring that impossible thing back to make it true, to make it happen. If I put it in words, how to reimagine the possible. First, imagine an impossible solution to a challenge you are facing, to a real challenge. Then reimagine it to make it possible. And finally, make it happen. The third law. I love the third law. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I'm thinking, oh dear, suppose Odysseus had GPS. He we wouldn't have skill line Haribis. He would have avoided them. And suppose Socrates and Platon Suppose they could do webinars. And suppose they could use all those lovely learning apps that Philippos spoke about. What would the academy have been like? OK, these are just thoughts. I would like to um, conclude with this, if you like, as a backdrop, because Without magic, we are nothing. So let's imagine together. And I want you to imagine, imagine with me, please. Imagine that this hand, this hand that becomes a fist, huh? that's you in PWC. And imagine that this red handkerchief, this represents all the obstacles to your imagination. And those obstacles could be, um, they, they, they could be, I don't know, your stunted puberty, your, um, uh, your own preconceptions, your own mindsets. And imagine that you have really learned how to practically reimagine the possible. And by doing that, you have succeeded in making all of these obstacles vanish once and for all. Thank you. Thank you.